and listens to the choir sings, Oh, I want to see him. so much choir. Take your hymnals once again please. Page 778. Stand with us. Let's sing in the sweet by and by. That's page 778. Please stand with us once again. There's a land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore as the instruments play through that a time or two Get around, shake hands with your neighbor. Tell him you're glad to see him this morning. Sing that second verse. On the
shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen thank you please be seated And right now we have Teresa She's going to come sing for us. I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Good job there. 
Good morning. Welcome to Pioneer Baptist Church. Good to see you all here today. I'm looking around. I see a lot of familiar faces. I don't think we have any first-time visitors here today, do we? Are we here for the first time in our services? All right. I'm one for one today in being right. I'm going to stop right there. All right, coming events. Pioneer Baptist School starts on September 5th. What is that, Tuesday or Wednesday or something the next week? Something like that? Yes. One of the days that ends in Y. I think it might be Tuesday. Might be Tuesday. You're right. I'm right? Well, don't lie to me, Nick. I wanted to be two for two. Whatever it is, school starts next week. And then track, track distribution is on September 9th at 10 o'clock. And then there's also going to be a, a celebration potluck here, time to be announced. And I think it has been announced at 1 o'clock based on what was just handed to me here. So what that is, uh, the roots of Pioneer Baptist Church go back pretty far, and you catch Papa sometime after church, and he'll tell you all about it. But um, Ron Ray, Pastor Ron Ray out in Texas, who was here for a number of years with us, has done some organizing to get some of the, the old groups back together again. And so that's going to be right here, 1 o'clock on Saturday to the 9th. There'll be a potluck, so if you're interested in participating in that, plan for that, put it on your calendar. It should be a, a good and interesting time and get a whole bunch of the folks back together again. And uh, interesting time of fellowship there. So put that on your calendars. We do have some birthdays this week. Larry Owens is coming up a couple of days here, tomorrow maybe. Yeah, tomorrow. So Larry's birthday. General DeBaca is back there and he's going to be 97 this week. That's up there. And Dad keeps talking about he doesn't want to get too old, but if he looks as good as him at 97, I guess it's probably okay. It's good. Yeah. 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 We'll take it. <laughs> Mario. Where's Mario? There's Mario behind the camera. His birthday is this week as well. And then Stephanie Cook is here today. Stephanie, it is great to see you. You're looking great. We've been praying for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I guess that would be Saturday. Any other birthdays or anniversaries this week to note? All right, it's the birthday song today. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, gentlemen, as you come, we'll mention the track of the week, and it's titled, Who Made It? And when I first looked at that, I thought, oh, who made it to heaven? Mm -hmm. But then I opened it up and started reading. It's more about creation and who made this world. And you can go to the Old Testament and the New Testament and get a couple of great things there. Of course, you lead off Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you can go over to John and see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. There from the beginning, it's all His. It's good stuff. Pick that up and read it. Pass that along to some folks. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I do thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for meeting with us today. And God, uh, we didn't mention folks here much by name in terms of prayer requests, Lord, but we mentioned a lot of folks lately. God, we continue to lift them up and ask for your intervention, your healing, and God, that you'd, uh, you'd work miracles in some lives, we pray. God, we pray that you would bless this time here this morning, bless this offering as we give it, take it, bless and multiply, we pray. In Jesus' name I ask it, amen.
Amen. Thank you so much, ladies. Take your hymnals one last time, please. Turn page 47. Stand with us, 47. Jesus, Lord to me. Page 47. Please stand. Jesus, Jesus, Kids, you're dismissed. Sing that once again. Jesus, Jesus, Lord, to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Someone to go the extra mile Just like a mother caring for her child A friend who sticks through thick or thin No matter what you've done or where you've been just like one great big family A stronger older brother he will be So quick and ready to defend The younger weaker to the end and he's ever interceding To the Father for his children Yes, for you he's interceding By the witness of his word through him you can reach the Father So bring him all your heavy burdens Yes, for you he's interceding So come boldly to the throne Oh, we like sheep have gone astray Struggling neath a doubt A load we cannot pay Not ever hoping to have new The love and fellowship He has for you he began to intercede 
Crying, Father, please forgive, I plead. And as the nails pierced in his hands, God was reaching down to man. And he's ever interceding To the Father for his children Yes, for you he's interceding By the witness of his word through him you can reach the Father So bring him all your heavy burdens Yes, for you he's interceding So come boldly to the throne Christ is ever interceding, so come boldly to the enjoyment I forgot to turn my microphone on. Great music, choir, special numbers, congregational, fantastic. Great blessing. Doctrinal and good. If you have your Bibles, would you open to Philippians chapter 3, please? And while you do that, I'm going to abuse my position here to say something personal. I love the Sunday school class that uh, Brother Enoch teaches. Sometimes I open my mouth inadvisably, inadvisably, and uh, Enoch asked me about the word husbandman, and I said, well, yeah, they're workers, but I see them as leaders. A husbandman is somebody that works in the soil. Husbandry is agriculture. So no matter what you're doing or what your position is, you're a husbandman if you're working in the soil. But I look at uh, Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard. Uh, he would have owned it. I will also break in pieces, Jeremiah says, with thee the shepherd and his flock. So you got the shepherd and the flock. And with thee I'll break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. I see ownership. Zechariah, but he shall say unto me, I'm no prophet. I am an husbandman for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. I am the true vine, Jesus said. My father is a husbandman. The husband that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits, and so forth. So, kind of my thought was on husbandmen, usually when we see it, you're not really talking about a servant. Now, you might be. Because if you work in an agriculture, then it doesn't own the farm or anything. He could be. But I look at husbandmen, Boaz was a husbandman. Boaz. So anybody that works in agriculture is a husbandman. And uh, anyway, so there's my half apology. Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 9, a familiar passage, and I loved it when Ben said, uh, pick any verse, they're all good. And that was a quote from Dr. Ruckman, so I liked it for a lot of reasons. Every verse in the Bible is good and true, right? However, some appeal to us a little more than others. When you go over there and see some of the genealogies and, you know, uh, this guy begat this guy and all that, you say, well, that's a good verse, but uh, I don't think I'll preach on it this morning. So when we go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, these are things that really, really get a hold of you, I believe. They do me. Verse 9, Paul writes, and he says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then he says, 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for the Bible, every word, every jot, every tittle. God, thank you for it. I can't imagine where we'd be without it. We'd really be a slave to whoever the best speaker was. We wouldn't have the authority of the word to guide us. We wouldn't have our real our Christian constitution. Whatever somebody could convince us about God, we'd have to try to figure out whether we believed it or not. But God, with this word, we have such clear and concise and reliable, perfectly so, instruction for our lives and revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, thank you for that. As we look to it here this morning for a few minutes, God, would you teach and instruct and bless and inspire us and motivate us? God, all of those things, we're so thankful for you, God, and for this word. And God, for the people of God, we're thankful as well. Please bless, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These are great and strong statements by the Apostle Paul. And in the broad sense, it pretty, well, pretty much goes back to that great verse, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I mean, that's a lot about what Christianity is about. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what we want in our lives. Now, by the time Paul writes to the Philippians, talking about knowing Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, he is now, at this time, imprisoned at Rome, probably from around 61 A.D. to 63 A.D. By now, he's already completed his first journey, second journey, and third missionary journey. And it was during his first journey, by the way, that he was stoned at Lystra. He was left for dead, and probably, most likely, almost certainly left for dead, and was dead, Acts 14, 19. It is conjectured that this is when he was caught up to the third heaven. And if I can read a little out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 for you here this morning, Paul says this, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now, I look at this as saying, all right, he knows what happened, but he didn't know if his physical body is caught up, or just kind of soulish and spiritually is caught up. Yeah, I don't know. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And if we drop down to verse 7 there, he speaks of the abundance of the revelations that were given to him, that he was privileged to receive, and that because of the inherent tendency to speak of his, to see himself exalted above measure. So, I don't have any revelation that you don't have. You know, it's possible that if I was caught up to the third heaven at some time in the past and saw things that God told me, hey, you can't even preach this stuff. I'm telling you, Jerry, but, but that's it. You've got to keep it quiet. Okay? It's unlawful for you to utter this. And then Paul goes on to say, you know, I suppose you could be exalted above measure on this kind of thing. You know, I could probably get pretty hefty speaking fees. Nothing like Bill and Hillary Clinton, but I mean, I could get some good speaking fees. So you look at this stuff, and again, because of this, the inherent tendency to see himself exalt, exalted above measure, there was given to him a thorn in the flesh. Also conjectured by some to be poor eyesight, basically because he said, I suppose you would have plucked out your eyes and given it to me at one time when he's talking about 
how highly he was held in regard by the people. And maybe then, you know, he can be up and down. And it sounded like he was being criticized a little bit. And he referenced back to, you know, when I came, you would have plucked out your own eyes. So some people have conjectured that maybe it was poor eyesight. I have no idea, just for the record. But there was given to him a thorn in the flesh. So why? Lest he should be exalted above measure because of what God told him when he took him up to the third heaven. I mean, that's pretty big stuff, right? John got revealed a whole bunch of stuff about heaven, which he did tell us. Paul, very little. Well, Paul wanted that thorn in the flesh gone, whatever it was. Okay? Uh, we've got people here. Uh, by the way, Stephanie's got nine more treatments. Keep her in prayer. Amen? Two more weeks, minus one. And it's like 40 stripes save one. But uh, keep her in prayer. She looks great. Glad to see you here. And Praise the Lord, and we're praying hard. Amen? Amen? Well, anyway, Paul wanted that thorn in the flesh gone, and I don't blame him. I don't know what's bothering you today physically, but you'll probably just as soon it, it wasn't bothering you or weren't bothering you. Uh, Carol got out of her car wrong and hurt her leg. She wasn't here Wednesday night. And a uh, Carol like Nick, if they're not here, it's a good reason. She hurt her leg, and could, but she's feeling better now. But uh, probably like to have all this stuff gone, Carol. Am I right or am I wrong? Hey, Benny's been right a couple times. Now I'm right once. Amen? Nobody likes, boy, my leg is killing me, and I'm glad. Now, Paul did say that he gloried in his infirmities, you know, and all of that. Why? Because he was looking at the strength of Christ in his life. And we, we can understand that part of it. But he did, glory or not, he did request three times that God would take it away. So I'm gathering he didn't like it that much. Hmm? You with me now so far? All right. Well, he's denied. The Lord said, no. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And that's when he said he would glory in his weakness. And I have a point to all of this, and here it is. Paul's desire was to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Now, you would think, I would think, I can't suppose to think what you would think, I guess, but I would think if anybody knew Jesus and the power of his resurrection, I mean, Paul would be high on the list, wouldn't he? He talked to Jesus on the road to Damascus. The Lord personally... Uh, intercepted him, intervention, and how many of us actually had Jesus come and talk to us and stop us on the road and ask us why we're persecuting him and, and tell him he had great things. You're going to be a witness before kings. You're going to be a witness to me. Now, we, it's enough so that we even talk about a Damascus Road experience sometimes. We'll say that person had an epiphany in his life, and sometimes, well, it was a Damascus Road experience, or, well, not everybody's going to have a Damascus Road. It's part of our, part of our one of the cliches, uh, idiomatic sayings that has worked its way into our language. A big deal. Amen? So here's Paul. He's going up there to persecute the church. Jesus comes down, has a conversation with him, uh, leaves him blind, sends a guy in to restore the vision to him, Ananias. And all of these things take place in Paul's life. And he goes on to have really a fantastic ministry of service to Jesus Christ. I don't know how many preachers I've heard say, well, one of my favorite guys in the Bible is Paul. Or we talk about the church age epistles and how much he wrote and the great apostle Paul. All of that has taken place. And again, you would think, wow, if anybody knew Jesus, it would be Paul. And if anybody knew the power of his resurrection, it would be Paul, because he was stoned dead at Lystra and then brought back to life. Went back into Lystra after that. He didn't quit. You know, he knew the power of his resurrection, I would say. And you might think, wow, I'd like to be an apostle Paul. Or maybe experience the things he said. Look, if God took me up to heaven here, uh, I don't want you stoning me. I'd like to be different circumstances. 
However, if God took me up to heaven for a while and then sent me back, that would be nice. I wouldn't mind that at all, would you? What am I going to have to do to get a little response here today? Anyway, that would, that would be great. So again, who could know better than Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection? You say, nobody. No, not so fast, my friend. Would you turn to John chapter 12, please? John chapter 12. Maybe there's somebody else that might even surpass Paul knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection. In John chapter 12, verse 2, we read this. One little verse. John chapter 12, verse 2. John 12, verse 2. There they made him a supper. That's Jesus. And Martha served. She was cumbered about much serving. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, I'd like to go to heaven. That'd be more fun than going to the White House. But if Donald Trump called me up today and said, look, we're having a White House state dinner and I want you to come and maybe sit just beside me, I just want to talk to you, Jerry. Right? Sean Hannity wanted to come, but I'd rather talk to you. That'd be pretty, that would be something. I'd like that. Maybe we could get Sheriff Joe to come and join us too. Imagine Lazarus is sitting at the table with Jesus. Now he's really sitting at the table with Jesus. This is not a fairy tale. It's not a dream. He is sitting at the table with Jesus, who is God Almighty, who created this world, created Lazarus. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha, Alpha and Omega. He knows everything. And Lazarus is sitting at the table with him. Not only that. Jesus loved Lazarus. John eleven five 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Not only that, Jesus stayed at Lazarus' house. I remember one time in Bangor, Maine, Jimmy Carter came to Bangor. And they picked some kind of regular good Democrat in the area. And it was only like three or four blocks away from my house. Obviously, the guy was not a high mucky muck. He lived in the same neighborhood. But, um, you know, Jimmy Carter came and stayed at his house one night. Somebody put up a sign saying, this is Reagan country. But imagine, in Luke 10, 38, now it came to pass as they went that he went into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Well, as I look at it, it looks like Martha and Mary and Lazarus were living there. And Jesus is now staying there. Then after what we call the triumphal entry, when Jesus made his, his uh, big entry into Jerusalem just before they were going to crucify him, and following that second cleansing of the temple, Jesus went back to Bethany, that's where they lived, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and lodged there, Matthew 21, 17. Now many people think Jesus spent these nights in the home of Lazarus. I have a source, Lenski, page 821. So a lot of people think, yeah, Jesus came back and he's staying at Lazarus' house. Now look, Jesus loved him. He was sitting at the table with Jesus. He definitely stayed there one night and maybe more. He's just hanging out at Lazarus' house. This is God Almighty right there. Now, interesting. Lazarus had been dead. John eleven fourteen. 14. We're right there. We can turn a page. John eleven fourteen. 14. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought he had spoken of taken of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, so he goes there, and in verse 39, when he got there, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, his, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. He's dead. He has assumed room temperature. They said, 
Take away the stone. Lord, man, he's in the tomb. He's been dead. He's de his body's decaying. Lazarus is dead. Now, Lazarus had received a special call from Jesus. Verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Lazarus is dead. He's wrapped up in grave clothes. Jesus comes and says, hey, take the stone away. Well, Lord, he's dead. It's going to stink. Take the stone away. They roll the stone away. Lazarus, come forth. Out he comes. Now, I'd say that's a special call, wouldn't you? Yeah. Amen. He'd been called of God. It was certainly a high calling of God. And he was certainly apprehended of Jesus. He apprehended him out of the tomb. And Lazarus certainly knew well after that the power of his resurrection. Hmm? Lazarus would have to know the power of his resurrection. He came out, they said, loose him. Imagine that. Verse 44 right here. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him, and let him go. All right, Lazarus knew that he'd been dead. When you're dead, you are not without consciousness. You're going to be either in paradise or a devil's hell. Read Luke 16. Nobody had lost consciousness. They were still thinking very clearly. Well, the rich man said, I'm tormented in this flame. And another Lazarus, he said, son Lazarus, he may dip his uh, finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented. Right? And then he, he's crying out to Father Abraham. And he said, send somebody to my brother. I got five brethren that aren't saved. Save them so they won't come to this place of torment. Here's a man that's dead, that's in hell, that is reasoning very well. Hmm? He can see, he can talk, he can think. He can reason. Lazarus was not there. He was in paradise. Different Lazarus. Now, so Lazarus knows he's been dead. When he comes shuffling out of the tomb in grave clothes, he knows he's been bound up. Right? And when Jesus said, loose him, let him go, now he knows he's been let go. And now he's hanging around, having dinner with Jesus and talking to him. Okay? <laughs> Listen, he has to know the power of his resurrection, is my point. Maybe, more, maybe even more than Paul. He would know, Lazarus would know the power of his resurrection. And this has got absolutely nothing to do with Lazarus' own righteousness. He died as he died. It was the sovereignty of God where Jesus came by. And now Lazarus had officially attained unto the resurrection. But he didn't do anything to attain it. God did it all. Lazarus, I would say, fits perfectly with and answers perfectly to Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. And be found in him, Lazarus was. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Well, that wasn't what got him out of the tomb. Not keeping the law, he was dead. But that which is through the faith of Christ, that's Lazarus. And it's a righteousness of God by faith. And again... Paul said that I may know him. Lazarus knew him. Benny was teaching school here one time before he moved on. And I, he got into it with somebody got into it with, between him and me. Between Benny kind of criticizing me to Benny, I think. And Benny said, hey, uh, wait a minute here. You know, I don't know if he mentioned that I was his pastor. He said, that's my father. He said, we hang out together. Right? Lazarus could say, wait a minute. I hang out with Jesus. Right? We hang out. He comes to my house. I have dinner with him. I was dead. He called me out of the grave. I mean, just put that in your brain. And then put it, plug it into Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. Boom! And the power of his resurrection. Lazarus, Lazarus lived it. Experienced it. 
and the fellowship of his sufferings. Well, they wanted to kill Lazarus. Because because of him, people were following Jesus. So the, you know, the guys that wanted to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus too. So he knew the fellowship of his sufferings. John chapter 12, verse 10. I should probably prove this to you. Just in case you think I'm lying to you again. Verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to, also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Of course they would. He's preaching Jesus to them. Say, man, look, I was dead, now I'm alive. Jesus is God Almighty. He pulled me out of the grave. And people saw it. People knew about it. This was not hidden in a corner. So, man, that's moving people. So what are the Pharisees going to do? Well, we've got to kill Jesus and we've got to wipe out Lazarus too. This is not good for business here. See? So he's conformable to the sufferings and conformable unto the death of Christ. And there he goes on to say, if any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, that happened. Not as though I'd already attained. I look at this and see attitude. I'm going to heaven. And you can't stop me. Amen? Amen? But we shouldn't walk around with an attitude as if we've already attained everything. We ought to be humble. We ought to keep working. We ought to tell, keep telling people about Christ. We ought to keep serving Christ. We ought to keep thanking Christ for the fact that we're going. And by the way, I think for all eternity we'll be thanking Christ that we got there. I don't think that attitude is ever going to change in the, in the life of the believer. And that's how I interpret that. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know, I want to grab a hold of the reason he grabbed a hold of me. Right? We're here to serve Christ. When he got a hold of Paul, he called Paul for a particular purpose. And Paul never lost sight of that. He worked hard, he finished his course, nothing stopped him. He said, I don't count my life dear unto me. Well, why would he? You'd already seen heaven. I talked about uh, Brother Max Graves coming in here and standing right here and talking about uh, our friend, the guy we love, Tyrone Jackson, dying unexpectedly and going to heaven. And uh, Brother Max, uh, Pastor Max Graves said, you know, death is no big deal to God. Now, we are precious in the sight of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But God's not sitting around weeping about somebody dies that he just called home to them. Amen? Amen. Somebody that died that went to heaven? He's not crying about that. We're crying because of a separation. Now we're lonely. Now we can't talk to that person. But it's not bothering God. He just called him home. Now he's sympathetic to us. He's got compassion on us. So in that respect, the death of the saints is precious. But it's not quite the same as sometimes we phrase it. We've been apprehended. God apprehended us to do a job for him. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you would think. You would think after you've been dead and called out of the tomb, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you're hanging out with him. You would think, wow. I'm going to work the rest of my life. To fulfill the calling of God. And I believe Lazarus did. Because if they want to kill him, he wasn't sitting around being quiet. He was a testimony by his life. Literally by his life. You want to talk about lifestyle evangelism? Amen. Which I don't completely believe in. But I think it's part of the process. I think we need to live and be a good representative of Christ. I'm going to start trying on that next week. I think that we ought, to, we ought to have a good lifestyle for Jesus Christ. But it's got to be more than that. We can't just walk around and say, yeah, people are going to look at me and say, wow, look at that guy. That guy is so outstanding. He's so special that I want to be like him and I'm going to be a Christian. I'm afraid that if anybody became a Christian looking at me, they did so in spite of me. We want to tell them about Jesus Christ, amen? Right? 
I mean, Buddy used to say, don't you ever put your trust in me. Put it in Jesus Christ. He said, I'll fail you every time. Now, Buddy was being humble. He didn't fail us every time. He was a human being. If you watch a human being long enough, it's like Dr. Smith following somebody around until he can give him a ticket. You say, why do you say that? I'm repeating what he told me. We got five minutes left here. Some guy either threw Pastor out of the gym or gave him a technical foul when they were playing on the police team. Okay? The guy was refereeing and he did that to Pastor Smith. And I'm sure Pastor Smith did not deserve it. Anyway, Pastor Smith knew, knew who the guy was. He worked, I think, for the Parks and Recreation Department. And he was driving down the street in his uh, motorcycle a couple days later, and he happened to see that guy. And that guy did something wrong. Maybe. And am I correct that he got a ticket? He did. <laughs> and I think the guy went down and beefed to the watch commander, who was one of Pastor Smith's good buddies, and, uh, hey, tough break. Now, I had a point to that. Right now, I have no idea what it was. <laughs> Paul is a great example of Philippians 3, 9 through 14. But can you imagine what Lazarus knew? Amen? And how absolutely convinced he was, how strong his faith was. We look at uh, that guy with his son that had a problem, and he said, Lord, I believe... You know, Jesus said, if you, if you believe, all things are possible. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. On occasion, even the apostles have faith got weak. This was not an apostle. His faith was weak. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Maybe you felt like that sometimes. And the apostles, when they got out there and the storm got going, and uh, the Lord said, you know, how is it that you have no faith? And I've called that situational faith. Yeah, God blessed. God gave me a raise. God made my car keep going. God gave me this. God gave me that. I believe completely. Whoops, I got fired. My car drove off the cliff. Now how do you feel? Now your faith is weak. You know, when things are going good, we got great faith. When things are going bad, we say, hey, where's God? God let me down. God doesn't care. What happens? Situational faith. Those apostles got out there and got rough and they said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? He said, how is it that you have no faith? They had faith. In the situation, it went bad. Lazarus was 100% convinced of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't he be? He had experienced it. How strong his faith was. Lazarus was a man who had faith and who could walk by faith, but he was also a man who could walk by sight. We say, oh, we don't want to walk by sight. Lazarus could. Couldn't he? What about the Apostle John? He saw heaven. In a certain respect, he's not walking by faith anymore. He's been there. He's seen it. He's back on earth. Hey, I don't need faith. I've seen it. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you've seen it, it's not faith. We're not going to need faith in heaven. God's going to be ruling. Satan's going to be locked up. Amen? He's going to be in a lake of fire. Beast and the false prophet as well. Mansions, streets of gold. We're not going to need faith. We're going to be walking on it. Right? We're going to be staying in mansions. Right now we say, boy, I'm trusting I'm going to get a mansion. I'm trusting I'm going to the New Jerusalem. I'm not trusting about those things. I got a, a 2002 Dodge Ram. I'm not trusting that I have it. I already have it. I may be trusting that it will start, but I have the vehicle. Amen? Lazarus had been there. He knew all about it. He knew all about it. You know what a great thing. He knew Jesus. Lazarus at point, some point died again, by the way. He said, well, it's the point another man wants to die. 
That's a general statement. He said, how do you know? Because Lazarus died twice. How do you know? Because I haven't seen him lately. Okay? Lazarus died twice. We don't know anything about that. We're not re- nothing recorded about that. We don't know how that happened. We just know that he did. It's just not that important when it's compared to his life. The fact that he died is not that important. If he did live right now, he'd be in very bad shape. You know, a guy 2,000 years old, we think uh, Mr. DeBarker, General DeBarker, is old at 97. 2,000 years is pushing it, folks. Amen? Or better that, somebody's pushing you around. So not all that important, but we know that he died. We knew that he knew Jesus Christ as few, few others do. And we knew that he knew all about the power of the resurrection in a very special way. Lazarus knew that. Lazarus knew Jesus. Lazarus knew the power of his resurrection. And one more thing. If we want to know Jesus as Lazarus did, Jesus must always be welcome in our home. just like he was in Lazarus' home. We better consider it a great privilege to be able to sit down at the table with Jesus like Lazarus did. Amen? We don't want to lock him up and just see him for an hour on Sunday. And if we're going to know the power of his resurrection, we have to be willing to die to self and to live for Christ. You can't know the power of his resurrection unless you've been dead. Not really. Now you say, what are you talking about? When we receive Christ, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we have to die to self. We have to be crucified with Christ. And by the way, you can't crucify yourself. Amen? Pretty hard to nail yourself to a cross. That's got to be done between you and God and you sacrificing yourself with Christ. Jesus will call. Amen? He's not willing that any should perish. He's called every man, woman, boy, and girl to eternal life through a faith in Christ. He'll call the dead to life. He'll give you new life if you'll die to self and live for Christ. And then, when we live and walk in that on a daily basis, we're supposed to walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we do that on a daily basis, we'll be walking with the Lord. Amen? Amen? Come and dine, the Master calleth. Come and dine. We'll be walking with the Lord. We'll be fellowshipping with the Lord. We'll be sitting at the table with the Lord. We're going to know the Lord and we're going to know the power of his resurrection. Not exactly as Lazarus did, but just as real. And every bit as beneficial when we put our faith in Christ and live for him. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the great truth of God's holy word. And God, for the sentiments that Paul expressed under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It's an ongoing thing. You may be in good fellowship with Jesus today, but not not so much tonight. It's an ongoing thing. God, we need to work at it and make sure he's not going anywhere. We need to stay close to him. And God, then we'll know him. And like Lazarus, we'll know the power of his resurrection. God, we would love it if everybody here was sure that they were saved, that nobody here would leave without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Oh, grant that, we pray. Not talking about joining the church. Be a good thing to do. Not talking about being baptized. Be a good thing to do. But we're talking about putting your faith 
in Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, which will be the power of your resurrection. But only in Christ, only as we receive him as our own personal Lord and Savior in our hearts. Not signing some contract, not going before some board, but going to God in prayer and saying, Lord, I know that Jesus Christ is God. I know that he died for my sins, and I know I have sins. And I want to receive him right now as my own personal Lord and Savior. And I do so in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the new birth. Oh, God, that everybody here would be positive that they've received Jesus Christ and his new birth and become a new creature in Christ and have the guarantee of going to heaven. Grant it, we pray. Thank you so much. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.